All right, so last time we had talked about the Persian War. We had not finished it. If you remember, we had gone through the causes of the Persian War, the Ionian Revolt, uh, the um, events about Naxos, just the long-term desire of the Persian Empire to conquer, and then we went through the war itself, and we talked about the Battle of Marathon and Thermopylae, and then Athens being burnt to the ground, and things weren't looking too good. So we have to finish up the Persian War today, and we're going to do also a discussion on the next war, the Peloponnesian War. So we got a bit of cover here. All right, so here's just the key word you want to get down for the end of the Persian War, right? So there's just a handful. You're going to get more key words again later as we go through the rest of the story here. Uh, so get all those down, write them down. And then I'm going to move on to the next slide. As always, just pause if you need to and get them all down. And we'll start talking about this. Notice where it says marathon generation here. I think I told you last time. Each of those three generations, remember in the setup I gave you last time, some of these names are repeated repeated because we're going to talk about them again. All right, so let's go through what happens in terms of the end of the Persian War and the impacts. All right, so this is our map, remember, and we had the Persian Empire sweeping in. They had defeated Athens, but this is the key. Yes, Athens was burnt to the ground, but there was almost no one in Athens because by now the Athenians had prepared. They had gotten off their, out of their city-state. Most of the women and children had abandoned the city. They knew the Persians were coming. And where did all the men go? Well, they all went on their boats. Which boats? Well, these boats, these triremes, these Greek triremes, which are key to the story of how the Persian War comes to an end. Because just as the Battle of Thermopylae was taking place, the Greeks had been getting on these ships. And as they get on these trirem ships, they were unable to really outmaneuver the Persian fleet very well. Uh, what had happened was the Persians didn't understand, again, the geography. It's that geography issue again, even the sea geography, oceanography, I guess you could say. Uh, but the, the Greeks were able to use these triremes very effectively. They destroyed much of the Persian navy in a very famous battle called the Battle of Salamis. And so this Battle of Salamis is, is key uh, to why the Greek um, were able to win the war. They were able to you know, defeat the Persians at the Battle of Salamis, this naval battle, and that gave them a really upper hand, you know, in terms of the rest of the war. Yes, there's still Persian forces, but after the Battle of Salamis around the year 480 BC, the Persians cannot bring reinforcements in mass to fight against the Persians. So we go back to our map here and of the general Greek world, and yes, there are going to be some more battles, uh, Battle of Plataea, you don't need to know that, uh, but there's these other battles that really don't matter too much in terms of um, the, the end game of the story because, yes, these are important battles, but it was just a matter of time at this point that the Greeks were just going to be able to outlive the Persian onslaught. And the Persians, after a while, just kind of gave up. They go, it's too much effort, too much time, too much energy. And it was that sea battle that is not as famous, the Battle of Salamis, that was key in getting the Persians out. And the Persians just leave. So then the question is, well, okay, what's the impact of the Persian War? So I want to spend a little time talking about the impacts of the Persian War, and that's also going to kind of transition us to our next story uh, in terms of what else happens in terms of the Peloponnesian War. But we're going to spend a little bit of time here on the impacts of the Persian War. So number one, the Greek world survives, right? So that's, that's important, right? If the, the Greek world doesn't survive, then that's the end of the story, right? Uh, but the Greeks do survive. The Persian Empire is not destroyed, but one of the impacts of the Persian War is that they are weakened. And remember, this is all part of this whole thing you need to know. If you remember in the last lecture, I was telling you, you have to know the causes, battles, and impacts of these wars. So now we're going to get into the impacts of the Persian War. So the Greek world survives, one obvious impact. Second obvious impact is the Persian Empire is weakened. They're never going to be quite the same. They're still big, they're still strong, but it took a, it took a little bit of a toll on them. That's going to come back and to be important later on. The third impact was the rise of Chimon. So again, that was that name I gave you before and was on this list of key terms again. But Chimon was very important as he led, remember, the Greeks and helped lead the, lead, the Greeks at the Battle of Marathon with his father Miltiades. And as a result of the Persian War, he decided to kind of take Athens into what we call a Pan-Hellenic direction. 
one of those words I put up. What does it mean? Panhellenic, basically all Greek. Pan, like panorama, Pan America, all Hellenic, meaning Greek. And what he's saying, he's not saying, hey, let's have a united Greek civilization when he says, let's be Panhellenic. He's basically saying, hey, look, it's really good. When the Greeks work together, we're able to fight the mighty Persians. So let's see if we can work together on this. And to that end, one of the impacts of the Persian War was the creation of that Delian League. And what is the Delian League? And this whole generation, I also put that term marathon generation there. So this is, again, this is all between about the years of 490, just to remind you, and 460. During this period of time after the Persian War, the Delian League is created. The, Delian, the Persian War comes to an end uh, right around the year 479. The very next year, 478 uh, BC, 478, horrible 478 there, uh, you're going to have the creation of the Delian League. What is it? Why is it important? How is it an impact of the Persian War? So let's answer those questions. So the Delian League is a coalition of any Greek city-states who wanted to. They would put money, manpower, resources in a joint Greek League in case the Persians invade again. We call it the Delian League because this was housed on a treasury on a tiny little island. You can probably barely see it, so I'm going to circle it, called the island of Delos. So it's like a neutral location. The money wouldn't be on any one particular Greek city-state. It would be on this island of Delos. And there, everyone put in money, and they used that to kind of have a joint fleet in case the Persians invade. That's the Pan-Hellenic idea, and that was created by Cimon, and he was very influential in Athens, and the Athenians were like, yeah, we're on board with this, again, during these years between about 490 and 460 BC. Sparta. Does Sparta join this Delian League? Well, no. Sparta's like, well, we're done, we're out, we don't have to worry about the Persians, and they're going to kind of do their own thing. Uh, eventually, they'll kind of create their own alliance system. But at this point, this is going to be key because this is going to, um, you know, push Athens into this pan-Hellenic pan -Hellenic mentality during that marathon generation. So anyways, that's probably the biggest impact right after the war. There are going to be long-term impacts to these wars as well. Uh, which you're gonna, we're going to get to. But for now, the big impacts of the Persian War is obviously the Greeks survive, the Persian Empire is weakened, Cimon gets elevated uh, to great heights, and using that momentum, he pushes Athens into this kind of pan-Hellenic mentality through the Delian League. So that's where we are during this first period of time in the 5th century. What next? Well, this is what's next. A next war that's about to begin the key words to the causes of the Peloponnesian War, right? Key words, causes of the Peloponnesian War. And so things are about to change very dramatically in Greek history. So get all these names down, everything here, all these words, all these places. They're all part of the story of the history of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, the primary source, I actually, again, put it here for you, the history of the Peloponnesian War by a man named Thucydides. I uh, brought my book with me just to kind of maybe show you. There's the history of the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides, uh, if you ever want to get a good detail. And you can see, you know, it's a, it's a nice thick book there, right? There's a lot of information there that Thucydides gives us on the history of the Peloponnesian War. That's so why I kind of wanted to show it to you as well. So we're going to go through again the causes, why the war happens. And then as we do that, we'll get to the next part of our story here. All right. So, uh, First name there, Pericles, right? So who the heck is Pericles? Well, as we get to the year about 460, Cimon is losing influence in Athens, and this man, Pericles, is rising to influence. I don't know if you've heard of Pericles before, uh, but this is going to be called the Golden Age of Athens. So if that first generation was the Marathon generation, this is the Golden Age of Athens, sometimes also known as the Age of Pericles, right? And it is him, probably more than anybody, who in the process of making Athens into a golden age will help trigger the Peloponnesian War, right? So we're going to kind of explain how all of this happens as we go through our story here. 
Uh, Pericles was known as a great orator, probably the greatest orator in all of Greek history, and we talked about that before. If you're a great speaker, you can influence people really well, and that's exactly what we're going to see coming out of Pericles. So that, that's kind of a good thing to remember and note as well. So what exactly is going to happen during his, these years that's going to push the Greek world into the Peloponnesian War? And just to kind of remember, the Peloponnesian War itself probably want to remember this, we'll, won't start until the year 431 BC. You don't need to memorize dates, but I want to show you in terms of chronology, we go almost through the entire age of Pericles before the war starts. So we're going to buy, kind of see how this is the golden age, but also the things leading up to the war against uh, Greeks versus Greeks. And that's the difference. The Persian War is Greeks versus Persians. The Peloponnesian War is going to be Greeks versus Greeks. So here we'll use this map to kind of describe the events leading up to the per Peloponnesian War. All right, so I'm going to kind of put this, I'm just taking the Thucydides, the Thucydides source, and I'm just kind of going to number them for you. Boom, 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 boom. You know, the basic things that happen in terms of why the Peloponnesian War begins. So number one, if you want our very first thing that we're going to have, the first event, is that Delian League. What happens with the Delian League? Well, if you remember... The Delian League, the treasury, was housed on Delos. And what Pericles decides to do is move the treasury from Delos, right over here, to, no surprise, Athens. And he says, now the treasury is in Athens. And then he says, because the treasury is in Athens, the patron goddess of Athens, Athena, is guarding the treasury. And therefore, every member of the Delian League must add an extra one-sixth of a tribute to Athena because Athena is guarding the treasury. Well, you know, of course, Athena never comes down to collect the money. And as a result of that, um, Pericles, is use, Pericles uses all that money to create the golden age of Athens. So this is where he's going to use the money. What is he going to use the money for? Well, what makes it a golden age? He's going to use it for military. He's going to use it for science, for art, for literature, for architecture. Uh, of course, one of the most famous things that's going to happen, I'll show you this in a second, is the Parthenon is going to be built during the Golden Age of Athens. Now, how is this a cause of the Peloponnesian War? Well, obviously, if you're Sparta, um, you should be worried a little bit now. It's like, hey, you know, what's Pericles doing here? These two are big rivals. Sparta really doesn't do much about this, but it is kind of the first kind of event that I think will eventually trigger the war. So here is the Parthenon. This is the very famous monument built in Athens. Uh, just a picture. It's a picture I took when I was there. Um, and it's really amazing, this Parthenon. It's massive, obviously. And it's, it's an amazing monument. What most people don't realize, it's not the entire monument because you could see all over here. This used to be a big like triangle there. And all along the sides, there are actually these beautiful marbles that um, are part of the Parthenon as well. These marbles, however, are not in Greece. So this is in Athens, right, on the Acropolis. The marbles, let me show them, to you, these beautiful marbles, they're actually in the British Museum in England. Uh, and, of course, they want them uh, in Greece, and the British are like, no, we're not going to give them to you. Uh, but these are some nice little marbles that they have, and you can imagine all of this dressing up uh, the entire Parthenon. But it is the, the point of showing this to you is it shows you how it is part of the, you know, golden age of Athens. All right, next. So back to our map here, and as we look at our map here, we're going to kind of run through the rest of the events that are going to help trigger the war, right? And so the first thing or was the issue of the Delian League being moved. The next major cause is just Athens going to become more aggressive. There's the city-state of Megara here. Athens is going to attack and conquer Megara. Sparta does nothing. And so after that, the Athenians like, well, all right, cool. There's, you know, we're not getting any um, opposition. And so they go after another city-state, Aegina. So again, the first thing is the Delian League. The second thing is going after Megara. The third thing is going after Aegina, right? These are all the little city-states he's going after that are going to be eventually 
if you're Sparta or the Greek city states, you're going to make sure you're going to say, hey, what's going on here? Why are we being uh, conquered? And Sparta's kind of the first bit not doing much. But after they take over Aegina, after Sparta, after Athens goes after Aegina, Sparta down here tells Athens and Pericles, quit it, stop it, you can't keep taking over land, be good. And Pericles actually says, okay, I'll be good, I won't conquer any more land. And I'll even give Megara its freedom. Well, he doesn't really mean it. He does give Megara its freedom. But what he's doing is kind of buying time. He knows he's not ready to fight the Spartans yet. So he's just kind of saying, hey, you know, just, you know, be good, be good. I'll, you know, I'll be good. Let me, let me uh, do my thing. Um, I won't do it. I won't conquer anything else. So that kind of creates a little pause, but that pause doesn't last too long. And remember, everything I'm giving you here is between 460 and 430. So I'm running through the events pretty much chronologically, but I'm not giving you specific dates. So the exact year he takes over uh, Aegina, the exact year he takes over Megara, that doesn't matter. As long as you know, first thing it's Delos, then it's Megara, then it's Aegina, then there's a little break. Then we get to the fourth thing. And after a little break, basically, Pericles says, eh, well, I want more influence. And he tries to take control of another island called Samos near Ionia. And because it's all the way over here near Ionia, you know, basically the Spartans like, well, I know Pericles promised he wasn't going to do anything, but whatever, we don't care. Every time Pericles in Athens does something and Sparta really doesn't do much about it, it builds up that one of the words I gave you there, the hubris, hubris of, of Athens and Pericles. And what does that word hubris mean, that key word there? Hubris is basically pride, right? Excessive pride. And it's this kind of very important part of Greek history where somebody has excessive pride and because they have so much pride, um, it, it leads to a downfall, right? And in this case, who feeds the hubris of Pericles? Well, it's Sparta every time they don't do anything. So up to this point, still Sparta is doing nothing. And so Athens really does some a number. They go after Corinth. Now, why is it important they go after Corinth? Well, if you remember, I briefly mentioned Corinth before, and I told you Corinth and Sparta were allies. In fact, if you look on the map here, everything you see in blue are going to be Sparta and her allies. Everything in red is Athens and her allies. Um, and so, you know, Sparta and Corinth were allies. And, and, and even then, after Athens went after Corinth, Sparta still did nothing. They're very upset. So now it's like Pericles, like, well, I can do whatever I want. And so what does he do? He returns back to Megara a second time. And that's the chain of events, right? That's a, you know, there isn't, there's a few things there, but not tremendous detail on each of them. So just to kind of summarize again, if you want to kind of put them in a list form, right, in a bullet form, it's kind of the key words I kind of did that for you. Uh, but it's the Delian League, it's Megara, it's a uh, move. So number one, Delian League, number two is Megara, uh, number three is Aegina, uh, number four, Four was taking over Samos, uh, number five was uh, Corinth, and the final thing that gets them into the war, Athens and Sparta in 431 BC, if you want to be precise of the date, is when Athens moves into Megara a second time. So those are the kind of events that led to the conflict, and so that's essentially how the war begins. All right, so now the Persian, the Peloponnesian War is going to start. Athens, Sparta, they go at it. Now, the first year of the war, Athens was doing pretty well. But then everything is about to change. And it's told to us by Thucydides. I'm actually going to read you a little passage here in a moment. But before we go on, I want to say a couple other things about Thucydides. So Thucydides, he writes the history of the Peloponnesian War. And he's a very good writer, very detailed writer, uh, gives us a very nice bit of information on what's going on in the war. But there's something else I want you to know about him. He was also a general. So that's going to be important a little bit. He was a general. He was a historian. He spent time in Athens and Sparta. So he's a really good source. And so he tells us what happens in the second year of the war. I'm just going to read this to you so you kind of get a little sense of what Thucydides writes like. Um, and it's a pretty important issue. So here we go. This is what happens year two of the Peloponnesian War. All right. This is what he says. People in perfect health suddenly began to have burning feelings in their head. 
Their eyes became red and inflamed. Inside their mouths there was bleeding in from the throat and tongue, and the breath became unnatural and unpleasant. The next symptoms were sneezing and a hoarseness of voice, and before long the pain settled on the chest and was accompanied by coughing. Next, the stomach was affected with stomach aches and with vomiting of every kind of bile that has been given name by the medical profession. He goes on to say, uh, for the disease first settling in the head went on to affect every part of the body in turn. And even when people escaped its worst effects, it still left traces upon them by fastening upon the extremities of the body. It affected the genitals, the fingers, and the toes. And many of those who recovered lost use of those members. Some too went blind. There were some also when they first began to get better suffered from a total loss of memory, not knowing who they were themselves and being unable to recognize their friends. Words indeed fail, one tries to give a general picture of, these, of this disease, and as for the suffering of individuals, they seemed almost beyond the capacity of human nature to endure. So what he's, of course, he's describing is a great plague that hits Athens the second year of the war, 430 BC. Well, this is devastating, and guess who's killed by the plague? Pericles. So Pericles is dead, we've just started the war, and things are not good, right? So right off, the war starts, Pericles is dead, and the question is, what happens next? So that takes us to the end of the Golden Age, but the war had just started. So now we just kind of run through the rest of the war and the aftermath of the war. So let's kind of move into that by looking at our next set, next set of words. And this is just kind of the key words of the impacts of the Peloponnesian War. There aren't that many of them, just kind of four. You get the third generation there, the age of rust that we're going to explain in a second. I'll talk about Cleon, Alcibiades, and what Thebes has to do with all this in a second. So here's our map, and so let's kind of talk about how this war unfolds and ends, and then what's next for the Greek world. So I'm not going to go into tremendous detail on this. You could read on Thucydides if you want, but I do basically want to tell you what happens. So Cleon emerges after Pericles, right? And Cleon a lot of people like Thucydides said, hey, it's time to cut a deal. Let's stop fighting. It's not a smart time to keep fighting. And, you know, Cleon said, I want to keep going. Why? Because he, you know, the first generation was Panhellenic. The second generation under Pericles was, how do I make Athens powerful? The third generation, Cleon, and then later Alcibiades, they only care about themselves. And Cleon wants to keep fighting for fame for himself. And so when Thucydides says, stop it, what happens to Cleon? What, what does Cleon do? I'm sorry. Cleon ostracizes him, sends him off. He goes to Sparta. So that doesn't work too well for, for the Athenians. Um, and then so they lose a general, remember. He's not just a historian. He's also a general. So then the war continues, and it continues for about another seven, eight years. Cleon is killed. After Cleon is killed in battle, that was around the year 422, I believe. Again, you don't need to memorize exact dates. But Cleon is killed in battle. Cooler heads prevail. And then Athens and Sparta agree to what we call a 50-year peace, right? 50-year peace where Athens and Sparta promise, promise not to fight each other, not to take over any more land, and so forth. Now, obviously, this isn't going to last 50 years. So, again, the war is going from 431 to 404. The four, uh, second year of the war, Pericles dies. For the next seven, eight years, Cleon continues the war. Then they sign a 50-year peace. Only lasts for a few years because then you get that other guy, Alcibiades. And what does he do? He violates the 50-year peace. He goes and he tries to conquer more land. Uh, I didn't put in the key word. If you don't remember it, it's okay. But it's a city-state called Syracuse. It's actually a little city-state in southern um, in Sicily. Um, so anyways, he violates the 50-year peace. Um, and this triggers the war again. And so they start fighting again. Uh, Alcibiades himself will be ostracized out of Athens because of all of this. He goes to Sparta, then he goes to Persia. It's just a big old mess. Uh, and, you know, the war keeps going. It's not going well. Again, long story short, without getting into a lot of details on this, 
the the Greeks, the Athenians just can't deal. You know, they they basically are suffering tremendously from that. They never recovered really fully from that plague. They have horrible leaders. That's why I call this the Age of Rust. They're suffering from the plague. Even the whole democratic system of Athens is going to fall apart for a bit. It's not a good situation until finally we get to the year 404. And in the year 404, Athens has no choice but to surrender. <coughs> Excuse me. Athens has no choice but to surrender. So then what are the impacts, right? What's the impacts of the Peloponnesian War? And so the impacts of the Peloponnesian War, and for that matter, the entire Greek world, is the last bit of information I want to cover still on this slide. And what is going to basically happen is the Greek world is going to, you know, have problems. They've been fighting wars for about 100 years, right? So let's start with Athens. As a result of the Peloponnesian War, Athens, number one, three things. Number one, Athens has to give up all its influence. So we know so everything you see on this red, all this Athens and allies, all that is gone. The only thing Athens is allowed to maintain influence over is the city of Athens, right? So that's in itself important, right? That's the only thing they maintain. Number two, Athens had to destroy all its walls, had these big, long walls that protected them. Athens had to destroy them all as a result of the Persian War, Peloponnesian War. And number three, Athens had to destroy its triremes, those ships that were so helpful in the Persian War that they still had. All of those ships had to go bye-bye. And the reason Sparta made them do that is they're trying to weaken Athens, and they were very successful in doing that. So that's number one. Athens is greatly weakened as a result of the Peloponnesian War. Now, that's not the end of the story because Athens is weakened. So then the question is, who rises to the top? If it's not Athens, when you say, well, it's obviously Sparta. Well, yes, that's true. But remember what I said about Sparta. They had an entire military of, what, 9,000 men at any given time. They were fighting the Persians. They were fighting the Athenians. This is going to take a toll on them. And so as we go further, the impact on that comes about 30 years later. So around the year 370 BC, Thebes, remember there's a, one of that last key term there, now becomes important. Because Thebes, that kind of Athens little sister, that city state that's just kind of north of Athens here. There it is again. I'll just circle it for you. Thebes decides they're going to now take a stab at Sparta, and they're successful. They defeat the Spartans. So this makes Thebes a more powerful city-state. Well, okay, that's fine, but fighting Sparta made Thebes weak. So by the time we get to about the year circa 450 BC, right, so now we're about 450 BC circa, um, Sorry, 350 BC, excuse me, 350, what am I doing? Uh, 350 BC, right? So about 350 BC, right? Uh, Athens is a shell of its former self. The Persians are a shell of their former self. Sparta has been defeated. Thebes is the dominant power, but Thebes gets weakened. And so when you think of the long-term impacts of the Persian and the Peloponnesian War, the real impacts is that this entire region, not only of the Greek world, but much of Asia Minor and Persia is now weak. Why does this matter? Well, it means this entire region that we've been lecturing on for the last several lectures is now vulnerable. Vulnerable to a new invasion from a new civilization. Who that new invasion is and who that new civilization is, well, we're not quite ready to get there yet because we're not completely done with the Greek story. We have now covered Greek history, primarily 800 to 400 or 350 BC to be more precise. We talked about Athens, we talked about Sparta, then we did the Persian and now the Peloponnesian Wars. But there's still a little bit more to study on the Greeks, and that's the, you know, the Greek literature, the science, the mathematics. And so you're going to have, a, you know, you have a discussion board on Antigone. Uh, we're going to do a lecture on some of the other Greek writers. So we're still going to cover all of that. And once we get through that, then we could talk about who is next for the Greek world. All right, so we're getting close to winding down the Greek. Hopefully you're enjoying the ride. And if you have any questions, please let me know.